The Tremont Street subway, part of the MBTA's Green Line, though I have mentioned it in a video about Boston and its neighbor streetcar network, we haven't been looking too much more detail about its creation. It wasn't as simple as... How does that even make sense? Hey, Howard. Hey, what's up, Henry? What if we took all the trolleys on Tremont Street and put them in a subway? What? See you in the meeting room in five? Wait! Okay. Henry, what's a subway? Yeah, definitely not that simple. It was actually accumulation of events that eventually led to the creation of America's first subway. So today, let's look at this historic engineering. Like in my first video, what happened to Boston streetcars, originally Boston had consisted of horse-drawn trolleys. When the first horse trolley ran in 1856, Boston had a population of about 170,000 residents. But by the mid-1880s, the population had boomed to 400,000. As I have mentioned in the first video, all these people the horses had to handle were really straining on the animals and led to higher mortalities. But that was not the only issue. Horses were slow and, as a result, more trolleys needed to be sent out with the increase in demand. With so many slow moving trolleys, as well as people in private carriages on the streets, it created congestion problems as well as gridlocks. The part of the city that had seen the worst travel was no other than Tremont Street and the Boston Common. When Boston saw a population boom after the 1840s, mainly due to immigrants coming from Europe, city officials were scrambling at how to ease congestion and eliminate gridlocks, especially on Tremont Street. So the city ended up limiting how many horse-drawn trolleys could be ran on the busy corridors, restricting to one minute intervals. But that all changed after Franklin Julian Sprague created the electric traction motor in 1886 and two years later created the first commercial electric trolley system. Sprague's invention caused a shockwave to not only Boston but all over the world to convert horse-drawn trolleys to electric streetcars. This got the attention of Henry Melville Whitney, the president of the West End Street Railway Company. Henry established the company in 1886 with combining Boston's five street railways. When Sprague's electric motor came to light, Henry was one of the first to convert all of his horses with electric trolleys. With the electric trolleys, it was faster and more efficient to move people, but that alone did not help the situation on Tremont Street. In the early 1890s, almost 200 streetcars ran through the street every hour along with a combination of other street dwellers. Trolleys were at standstills, so much so that people jokingly walked on the roofs of the streetcars as a faster means to get around. In 1887, Henry brought the idea to the city of having a subway run on the Tremont Street before the electric trolley made its way into the city. But everyone was very skeptical about the idea as it was associated with London's Metropolitan Railway built in 1863 which consisted of a steam locomotive with passenger coaches. Having a steam engine rumble underground in the dark while spewing ash and debris was not very much liked by Bostonians. People also had the superstition that by being underground meant being closer to the underworld and the devil. Look, I understand people were weird back then, but it's not like our generation is any different. So just keep an open mind, okay? Okay, good. But with the horrible blizzard in 1888, which paralyzed the whole east coast of the US, gridlock traffic, and a new technology, Boston city officials had finally caved in. In 1891, the city council formed the Rapid Transit Committee to find ways into relieving congestion in the busy areas of Boston. By April of 1892, the committee found several solutions, one of which was to create a subway between Boylston Street and Canal Street via Tremont Street and Scully Square today's government center. In 1894, politicians passed an act to create the Boston Transit Commission so the commission could build the subway with Howard Adams Carson as the chief engineer. On March 28, 1895, the Tremont Street subway began construction. The commission had a few different projects to build, which included an incline at Pleasant Street and somewhere along Boylston Street, called the Public Garden Portal. The two inclines would converge at Tremont Street, making their way to Scully Square and then at the Canal Street Incline. The first phase was to create a route from the Public Garden Portal to get to the Boylston Street stop and finish at Park Street Station. Between Boylston and Park Street, four tracks were in place. The two inner tracks accommodated trolleys using the Public Garden Portal, while the outer tracks were used for the Pleasant Street portal. To create the tunnels, workers used a technique called cut and cover, which was also used in the building of the Metropolitan Railway in London. First, soil was dug out in 12 feet long, 10 feet wide, and 6 feet deep sections with wood braces installed to both anchor the soil and create a roof for bricks to be laid. Then, the trench went deeper to about 50 feet, where workers built a supporting structure in place before covering the structure with concrete and soil. Opposition had grown against the construction of the subway, over 10,000 business owners, as well as politicians and citizens, petitioned against having any railway built underground. 
This is a wicked expensive project. There aren't any traffic problems. Why, I haven't seen anybody get hit by a horse in two days. Where's my Dunkin' coffee? Hey, pal, uh, you're about 50 years early on that one. I'm sorry. Is there any tea left in the harbor? There were three main issues emerged by the public. First, the project seemed expensive at the time because a tunnel project done in western Massachusetts, the Hoosack Tunnel, exceeded its budget. Additionally, the public did not want their tax dollars to go towards the subway, rather have it financed through private interest. Second, to business owners, the subway didn't seem like it could solve any traffic issues, as in their eyes, traffic seemed fine on Tremont Street. They even argued that the traffic actually helped with their businesses. Finally, the project was approved through a ballot measure. However, the ballot included the creation of the subway along with an elevated railway that runs through the city. State Representative J.J. McCarthy was very much against having the subway built and believed that voters only voted to have the subway built by a narrow margin only because the elevated railway was included in the ballot. Why would Bostonians want to have an elevated railway built over a subway? <laughs> oh, the subway, go on. Just drink your tea. It just goes back to the idea of the devil and the underworld, but the people still wanted to have a rapid line service in the city, and so the elevated railway was more appropriate in their eyes. Two additional problems prevailed during the construction of the subway. The first was the Boston Commons Central Burying Ground. Before construction took place, the engineers were aware of the possibility of disturbing remnants of those passed away and made sure ahead of time if it was alright to proceed with the construction. It was permitted as properties of graves were old and no one knew who owned which grave. However, during the digging, bones were found scattered all over the site. Over a hundred bodies were thought to be found, though most could not be fitted to a whole body. This had a negative image towards towards the public. Even though workers tended care towards the found remains, this was viewed as a superstition that the subway should not be built or have been built in the first place. The second issue spontaneously occurred on March 4, 1897 when there was an explosion on the corner of Tremont and Boylston. Gas was leaking for months without a known source of the leak until a trolley spark caused the gas to ignite. The explosion caused damage towards the construction as well as the neighborhood and left 10 people dead and 60 wounded. But alas, on September 1st, 1897, the Tremont Street subway opened with the first trolley running from the public garden portal down to Boylston station and finishing at Park Street station. The Pleasant Street incline opened 30 days afterwards. A year later, Scully Square station as well as Adam Square and Haymarket were open and the completion of the Canal Street incline. Bostonians adapted to the new mode of transit and abandoned all fear associated with the underworld, darkness, and poor air quality. I mean at the time you had factories in the city which had poor air quality and you had acid rain so you were better off living and working underground than you were on the streets of Boston. Because trolleys moved faster underground, the Tremont Street subway expanded over the next few decades and prompted other subway lines to be built. Though those lines will be covered at another time. What do you mean? They already covered it, didn't they? <laughs> Let us take a look at the subway's expansion over time, shall we? June 1st, 1912, the Causeway Street Elevated and the Lechmere Viaduct opened for operation, with stops at North Station West and Lechmere. On October 3rd, 1914, the Public Garden Portal was relocated and was called the Boylston Street Portal. There was also the completion of Copley in Massachusetts Station, with an additional incline built at Kenmore Square. Arlington Park Plaza Station was open on November 13th, 1921. On October 22, 1932, the incline at Kenmore was closed and the following day, the Kenmore Underground stop was open as well as the St. Mary Street Portal and Blandford Street Portal, serving Today C and B Branch respectively. On February 15, 1941, the Boylston Street Portal was permanently shut down, but the following day, the Huntington Avenue Portal, serving Today's E Branch, opened along with Symphony Station and Mechanic Station. On June 20, 1955, Science Park Station opened. On July 4th, Whoa! America! This tea couldn't taste any sweeter! Uh, I'm sorry, go on. <sighs> On July 4th, 1959, the Fenway Portal as well as the Highland Branch, today's D Branch, began operation. November 19th, 1961, the Pleasant Street Portal was permanently shut down. On October 28th, 1963, Adam Square Station was permanently closed with the remodeling of Scully Square Station. Scully Square was renamed to Government Center. December 3rd, 1964, Mechanics Station was renamed Prudential after the completion of the Prudential Tower. On February 18th, 1965, Massachusetts Station was renamed to Auditorium. 
Stadium for the completion of the John B. Hines Memorial Auditorium. In 1967, North Station West was renamed to North Station. In 1985, Arlington Park Plaza was renamed to Arlington, and in 1990, Auditorium was renamed to Hines ICA because of the implementation of the Institute of Contemporary Arts. On June 25, 2004, the Causeway Street Elevated permanently closed along with the elevated North Station stop, temporarily stopping trolleys from getting to Lechmere. Three days later, the new underground North Station stop opened for trolley service. On February 12, 2005, Science Park Incline opened, allowing trolleys to head towards Lechmere. Finally, in late 2006, Heinz ICA was just named Heinz Convention Center after the move of the ICA and Science Park was renamed to Science Park West End. Quite a lot of history for such a small subway line. But before we finish, let us go back to what the Tremont Street subway was supposed to do to ease congestion on Tremont Street. The answer, not really. Yes, the subway took streetcars off the streets and put them underground and they ran faster, but the congestion on Tremont Street was and is still there. This is a topic that is much bigger than the Tremont Street as it affects every single dense population in the world. There are plenty of videos on YouTube that talk about congestion and this thing called induced demand. This is something that I would like to touch upon myself as well as some opinions thrown in a future video. We should also look at whether or not the Tremont Street subway or even today's Green Line is a true rapid transit. And again, that is something to talk about in a future possibly opinionated video. For this video, I just wanted to inform you about the Tremont Street subway through the sources and references that I use, including the the book and documentary The Race Underground by Doug Most. I highly recommend either watching the documentary or reading the book as they contain a lot more information than I could in this short video. There are other sources listed in the description for any other information. But for now, next stop.